ready to get started. I'm going to turn it over to Maureen Toll. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is our last uh, session, session three, and it's our second session on pension. And uh, we're um, going to be covering certain topics that we didn't cover in the first session. If you go to uh, the roundtable discussion topics, uh, I'll go over that. So what we're going to cover in this uh, to supplement the first session is uh, what are the latest trends and in investments related to pensions? What steps do pension systems uh, need to take to shore up their sustainability? Um, how do we tr protect uh, the solvency of our retirement systems without straining our overall budget? And how are local governments and, the, and their, their uh, state systems preparing for the future? Uh, what are their local systems doing? And what tools and forecasting solutions uh, are available that can be used by local governments to build up upon their financial and pension uh, uh, resiliency. Uh, before uh, we get started with those topic matters, we wanted to introduce uh, myself. I was on the last session. Uh, Maureen Toll, I'm head of national consulting for uh, public agency retirement services. And my background is in, in government, working with pensions and, and OPEB. And Dennis Mullins, who you may have seen on the last one, uh, he's the managing director and senior portfolio manager for U.S. Bank, and he's currently managing 1.5 billion in assets. And he has, I think, he mentioned 40 years of investment experience, going back to uh, to BlackRock and some other uh, uh, investment firms before coming to U.S. Bank. And one of the unique aspects of Dennis is that he is uh, a CFA, but he's also a CPA. So he brings uh, accounting and investment uh, prowess to, to these discussions. And then Iris Summer, who was also on the first uh, session, uh, is a senior consultant for GovInvest, um, also an actuary by background. Um, and I won't go into some of his other um, um, comedic and other talents that he has, uh, but, uh, but he has a tremendous amount of experience as well. And so we'll, we'll go on, we'll first focus on trends in pension investing, and then uh, we'll focus a little bit more with Dennis on this with Ira uh, giving color commentary. And then uh, the second part of this will be to talk about uh, trends in pension uh, and financial uh, sustainability. And uh, Ira will focus a little bit more like about that and uh, with, with some uh, Dennis commentary. And I'll be the MC, so I'll be basically guiding them through uh, the questions and topics. Thanks, Maureen. Um, I'm going to start off by talking about trends and investments in very general terms. You know, when we look at um, pension plans for whom we manage assets and those that we've, you know, talked to over the years, um, historically, retirement plan asset growth has relied pretty heavily on investment returns. About 60% of the growth in retirement assets historically has come from investment returns with the remaining 40% coming from both employer contributions and employee contributions. But you can see there's a heavy reliance on investment returns um, over the long run. And, and, and the market has really been able to provide a big boost to pension um, asset growth over the last you know 10 years um, and more for the last for the last 10 years, the, the, the median public pension return is eight and a half percent. And as we, we're, we're at a bit of a, an inflection point in the markets right now because of a, of a number of factors. We've got rising interest rates really um, in some ways for the first time in about 40 years. And that, you know, that's pretty much the length of anybody's career, meaning that there's nobody in the business that's ever managed assets or been overseeing pension assets through a period of broadly rising interest rates. And we always hesitate in this business to say this time it's different. But when it comes to interest rates, um, we really have been in a declining interest rate period for a long, long time. I mentioned on the last session that in the early 80s, you know, we saw uh, short-term interest rates with money market funds paying in excess of 14%. 
And in the last few years, those same money market funds have been paying basically zero. And so um, the big question is going to be, how will markets respond to rising interest rates that they've you know, pretty much never seen before? And one of the things we looked at was, even with the tremendous volatility, even with the 34% decline in the market in early 2020, as economies around the world decided to shut down their all economic activity, um, even with that, we've seen pretty much um, of an uptrend, a strong uptrend in the markets for the last several years. And I put a table on here that shows for the past five years, what kind of returns we've gotten out of a number of high profile benchmarks. Um, with the key being the S&P 500, we've returned over 18% per year for the last five years. And that's, that's an average annual. So that's almost a 100% return over the last five years on a cumulative basis. And in many respects, a lot of participants have grown accustomed to relying on that kind of contribution from market returns. At the same time, <clears throat> pardon me, most of us in this business do not believe that those kind of returns are going to continue. And while we don't have a lot of, um, you know, pinpoint success in looking out into the future and trying to judge where returns are going to be, we do have the ability to look at things such as valuations and, and, and risk premia and um, compare that to risk-free rates and, um, and then look out into the future and say, what kind of returns do we expect we'll be getting out of most of these asset classes? And I've, I've put those in the table in the second column, and this is the U.S. Bank capital markets assumptions from early 2021, I'm sorry, early 2022. But we're not alone out there in saying that you know, to go forward and tell people to expect 3.8% out of the stock market on a per year basis for the next five to seven years, um, that's a bit alarming. And um, uh, that's by design. We, we're being very clear with our clients right now in all of our meetings that the types of returns that we've become accustomed to, we don't think we're going to be able to get going forward. And there's a number of reasons beyond interest rates for this. But um, uh, but again, it's, it's, it's pretty common in the industry to see these types of, of returns. So, you know, what are the trends we're seeing out there? The, the trends we're seeing are that pension plans have relied heavily on investments and investments are probably not going to come through for pension plans in the future, the way they have in the past. Maureen, let's go ahead. Dennis, to the next Dennis, slide. You, you, ahead, you right. mentioned before, before you slip from, go from that one, um, yeah. that uh, you, People are, you know, investment advisors are hesitant to say things are different this time. Right. Um, but in my mind, it's more uh, a question of, you know, back to, you know, we just haven't experienced it in a while. The, the strong right. returns and the reliance right. on those strong returns reminds me of the late 90s, where things shot through the roof and everybody was confident that no matter what went wrong, it would keep happening. Uh, and as a result, we had the, the bubble burst in early 2000 and weak returns. Uh, you know, we had okay returns for a few years, but then we had the, the big collapse in 2008, 2009. If we look at that seven, eight, nine year period, um, we're, we had net returns, you know, comparable to what you're talking about now. Um, things, you know, when, when the investment community gets overconfident, there, you know, things boom for a while, and then there's a correction. Um, and yeah, yeah, the last time we saw rising interest rates were the late 70s, and very few people who were doing investing in the late 70s are still around working right now. Right. Yeah, right. yeah, good point. And, you know, I, I mentioned that prime rate hit um, 21% in, in the early 80s. At that time, the, the S&P 500 was trading at a multiple of about eight times earnings at, at its low. Um, but it was uh, a much lower level of uh, market multiple than we're seeing now. Right now, the market's trading at about 20 times earnings and we've got interest rates near zero. So those two numbers are almost just, you know, reverse between now and then. So again, in, you know, in many ways we're seeing that, you know, the market, um, 
tends to do better than it probably should in a lot of the good years and, and then tends to correct more than it should in the bad years. But the key really is what is the long term? And we talk a lot about time horizons. Um, uh, the, the time horizon from an investment standpoint, it tends to be about five to seven years. And, and I think in many ways, the time horizon for pension plans is, can be much longer can be, you know, in, in a matter of decades, we're looking out over 20 to 30 years. So, you know, a lot of this we want to keep in perspective. We might be entering a period where we believe market returns will be weaker over the next, say, five years than they've been over the last five. But we're still very long-term investors. And so we want to keep a long-term asset allocation and a long-term investment plan in place. This um, On this chart, I've got a table that kind of graphs the same information I showed before, but um, across the bottom, you see a series of dots that shows the expected returns and risk of a variety of portfolios with the uh, annualized return expectation on the vertical axis. And you can see all of the dots are below 5%. Um, that's much lower than we've seen in the past. Up at the top, I've got the actual returns from similar portfolios. And you can see all of the returns are between say nine, 10, almost 12%. So just a picture of the data that was on the previous chart that shows expected returns for the next five to seven years, much, much lower than we've seen in the last five. And then I also, just to add a little more credence to the forecasted returns, I put our forecast for large cap US stocks and bonds up here, but I also put those for Invesco, Charles Schwab, Vanguard, BlackRock, Fidelity, and JP Morgan. There's a lot of brain power behind a lot of these forecasts. And it's tough to go forward and say, um, you know, again, we, we see a pretty low return coming out of stocks, but we don't want to, um, you know, investments is not an area where you want to, you want to over promise and under deliver. Uh, we'd rather do the opposite here. So what we can take away from this primarily is that across the board, most of our industry is expecting returns to be lower in the future than what we've seen in the past. And, and one, one thing I do want to sort of mention to people about these numbers uh, that you have from different, different you know, experts in the field is this is their expectation for markets. This is not them saying, uh, I can earn more than these other people. They're all looking at the market as a whole, not what they're doing. So the fact that, that in this case, Charles Schwab has slightly higher returns expected than Vanguard, doesn't mean that Charles that the market for Charles Schwab is going to be better than the market for Vanguard. It means their expectations are different. Um, right. So, right. Uh, right. Yeah. yeah but public pension systems all have consultants, uh, you know, advising them on you know expected returns and whether they make modifications to the discount rate. But all the all these consultants are basically. Uh, you know, singing the same song in that, uh, you know, expected future returns are going to be lower. And sure. so, um, you know, of course that becomes the job of the actuary as well to, to um, figure out um, the discount rate and discount rate recommendations. Do you have any comments on that from what you see with public pensions around the country, Ila? I mean, public pension plans have been, have been lowering their discount rates for the last two decades. And this is largely due to the phenomena that, that Dennis was talking about before, that somewhere between a third and a half of their portfolio is in fixed income and fixed income rates have been dropping consistently since 1980 down to 2020. So if half your portfolio, instead of expecting it to earn 14%, is now expected to earn half a percent, uh, your total portfolio is going to have a lot of trouble hitting hitting high targets. So you move the targets down. Either that or you move more of the money into other asset classes. And then what Dennis is saying right now is that doesn't work anymore either because the other asset classes are also going to be earning less than the, the targets that most agencies have. The targets that used to be in the seven to eight, and in a few cases, the eight to nine range 20 years ago, uh, are now in the six to seven range. And we're looking at numbers that it's going to be hard for the next five to seven years to earn in the four to five range. 
Um, and you know, the way that some agencies are thinking about doing this, and I wouldn't even think about it if you're a small pension fund, but the huge pension funds uh, are adding more leverage, um, which means there's more risk, which means if things go badly, they're going to really go badly. And now may not be the time to, uh, to do that, you know, depending on, on, you know, your revenues may not be able to handle things going really badly. I mean, the, if you look at this graph, the, the bottom horizontal axis talks about risk of standard deviation, which is the way most people look at it. But when you think about it from the perspective of the agency, the risk is the chance that stuff's gonna, gonna go the wrong way. It's gonna drop down. Um, and while it's related to standard deviation, it's not exactly the same thing. Um, you know, it's why some, some investments sort of give you a much smaller chance of loss than others. But those are also the ones that tend to give you lower returns. So in terms of trends uh, exploring, Dennis, different um, investment choices um, that pensions funds are exploring, um, um, and new asset trends like private uh, markets to improve yields, wh what are the challenges to uh, these involved in adopting these com more complex investment strategies? Well, there's quite a few. So, um, you know, just to kind of clarify, you're, you're talking about generally private equity and private debt. So, um, you know, put very simply, uh, most of the investments that we invest that we use for almost all of our clients are public investments. They're available to the public, they're advertised to the public, and it doesn't take any special qualifications to invest in them. Private investments are different. Um, they're, they're riskier with a greater upside. And um, a lot of the challenges that come along with these really don't sit well with uh, medium and smaller pensions. And those include, uh, first of all, the fact that they're less liquid. A lot of times there's a lockup period for these investments. Um, you can't just sell them and get out. So for most of the pensions that I manage, if, um, if for some reason they wanted to liquidate an investment today, as long as the market's open, we can get that trade in and get that asset liquidated, get it sold. Uh, these private investments are not that way. There may be gates um, and certain scheduled times when you can put in a request to get your money back. And if you've got to get your request in by that date, and then it might be a month or two before you hear back whether or not you're going to get your money. And this is so that the fund manager can go out and make commitments with, with those assets. And so they have to be able to control the asset flow to go in and say, I'll provide financing for your leverage buyout or your business or your, uh, your expansion, whatever it is we're, we're asking that fund manager to do. So you may not be able to sell it and get out. And that bothers a lot of investors. There's less transparency, there's less reporting, there's less information on what you're doing. We may hand over the money to a fund manager and not really be able to explain to the client what exactly your money's going into. And there's good reason for this. Uh, these deals are very um, confidential. And uh, we, wanna, we wanna find somebody who's really good at making deals and we wanna give them money to go out and make deals. And they're not gonna tell us, hey, here's a deal I'm working on. That's, that's not how they're gonna do business. So there's not gonna be a lot of transparency and that doesn't sit well with a lot of investors. Uh, the market values might be very stale. We might be issuing a December 31 statement with a value for a private equity investment that is nine months old or more. And then in addition to that, um, higher fees. Uh, there's, it's a lot less efficient business. Um, these managers are out you know, in conference rooms, meeting with businesses that wanna sell, meeting with businesses that wanna expand, meeting with businesses that wanna borrow. And so costs are a lot higher. It's not uncommon to see costs in excess of 2% of the, the amount invested. So those are some of the challenges, not even to mention the paperwork involved. The clients have to be pre-qualified because um, we have to basically show that you're a sophisticated investor and, then, and that we all know what we're getting into. Okay. Um, another trend is the growing commitment to ASG for public pensions. Um, 
Can you touch upon that and also recent divestment issues, particularly uh, related to Russia um, as, a, as a trend going on with public pensions? Yeah, exactly. Um, there's, um, there's a slide we can move forward to on ESG. Yeah, move forward to the ESG slide. I, I don't remember exactly what slide that is. Um, yeah, keep, keep going here. Get keep going. Ahead. Next. One more. One more. There you go. <laughs> Back one. Yep, there you go. All right. So um, ESG stands for Environmental and Social Governance Investing. And you mentioned Russia. And this, this is a real good example of, of when ESG, or what we used to call socially responsible investing, comes up. Um, a lot of public plans, especially, um, have uh, environmental and social uh, objectives that, that they adhere to in their running their own business, and they want to make sure that their investments are consistent with those. Um, we got a couple of uh, calls from clients after Russia invaded the Ukraine, and they said, we want to make sure we don't own any Russian investments. And as you know, there's a, uh, there's a bill working its way through the California legislature would, that would make that um, mandatory by law that uh, there would be no direct investments in Russia. And um, this is a great example of, of an exclusion type of socially responsible investing objective. Um, I don't wanna own anything in Russia or I don't wanna own any company that deals in uh, coal or, or any fossil fuel um, companies, things of that nature. And what we'll typically do in this industry is we can exclude those types of investments from the portfolio. But we're seeing a trend towards a greater approach. And by the way, Russia, um, Russia is in the emerging markets. Um, Russia is about 5% of the emerging markets. And most portfolios might have about 5% in emerging markets. So um, you're talking about 0.25% of the portfolio in Russia, if, if you meet those, you know, those percentages. Um, not only that, but from a, from a practical standpoint, a lot of the sanctions immediately made it impossible to divest of your Russian investments because, um, because of banking law changes, we made it um, very, very hard for the Russian stock market to function. <clears throat> and so when clients called up and they said, get me out of my Russian investments, we said, well, we can't um, because we can't transact in those right now. So there's some practical sides to it as well. You want to move Generally, you want to move slowly and methodically and deliberatively on these uh, types of topics. But the trend that we're seeing in, in ESG investing is um, most clients are saying we have very broad environmental and social governance goals, and we want our, our investments to comply with those. We can either accomplish that by buying funds that themselves have environmental and social governance principles that match what you're looking for. Or um, we can buy companies that themselves have said, we are going to strive to meet these environmental and social governance goals. So um, most companies themselves, um, if you just watch the behavior of companies, you'll see that they are individually wanting to move to a direction where they can be um, on the good list, you know, of, of people who have very strict environmental or social or governance goals. And, and so uh, we believe in the long run, ESG investing is going to become mainstream. And it's, it's going to be very difficult to actually operate outside of those constructs. So um, it's something that's, it's something that's uh, gaining a lot of traction. Um, it used to be that there was concerns about producing lower returns if you follow these uh, goals and, and objectives. Um, that's sort of diminishing over time as we're seeing more and more mainstream companies adopt these policies on their own. Yeah. Um, one other trend before we get into the sustainability issues is um, as pension funds look to improve their you know, cost efficiencies, optimize their costs, um, what are they doing to, to lower investment expenses? So, for example, indexing in, you know, in sourcing versus outsourcing, fee transparency, that type of thing. Uh, what are the latest 
approaches that you're seeing to driving down uh, investment costs? Well, it's, it's just that. It's paying attention to costs. And a lot of investment costs are hidden. I have uh, several clients who make it a routine that in the first investment committee meeting of the year with quarterly meetings, one of the agenda items is break out all of the costs for me in as much detail as we need for everybody in the board to understand it. And on slide nine, we've actually got, I, I think we're actually beyond slide nine now, but if you go back to slide nine, we have a, a chart that shows, um, is that it? No, I, I'm sorry, I have the wrong slide number, but there, there, this one I'm looking for. This is a, a, a chart that just shows where the S&P 500 index ranks among active mutual funds from Morningstar. And as a proxy for the S&P 500, I just used the Spider S&P 500 ETF, but it's virtually the same return. And you can see that over periods more than the you know, the current quarter, um, the S&P 500 itself ranks near the top of the universe of returns by those managers who are, um, you know, purporting to be active large cap U.S. equity managers. So what does this mean? This means you'll probably be just as well off by indexing your large cap equity portion of your portfolio. It's usually one of the largest pieces of the portfolio and one of the, the higher costs if you're going with active management. But we use S&P 500 index funds in this space that charge us 0. 0.02% or two basis points. And really that's where the bar is set. If you're paying 75 or 85 basis points or 0.75 or 0.8% of the assets you're investing for a management fee and you're not producing results that are better than this, then you're losing money to simple indexing. So the argument for indexing is there in a couple of asset classes. So I would put the burden of proof on your providers to show that the fees are additive, that on a net of fees basis, I'm doing better than I would by simply indexing some of these asset classes. Yeah, and we're also seeing also some, with some of the large state systems, there's been recommendations uh, to, 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 to fully index uh, portfolios, you know, to, to move into right. strategies, reduce active managers. Um, some of those have been recommendations in evaluating like state systems. And uh, of course it's happening uh, with local individual pension uh, systems as well. So uh, thank you, Dennis. I'd like to turn um, to um, Ira now to talk about the sustainability of, of public pensions. What's, what steps do pe public pension plans and systems uh, need to uh, take to shore up their sustainability? Well, sustainability is, is going to come through several different categories. Uh, the first thing that a lot of, of reform has happened over the last couple of decades it starts, it starts with your benefit levels. Uh, so you need to make sure that you have that, that during, if you go back in time, you'll remember that for a lot, as Dennis was speaking about before, the, the returns during the 90s shot up through the roof. Everybody thought things were going well, as we talked about in the, the first session. Uh, the reaction for uh, many public plans at that time, right around the late 90s, early 2000s, was to improve the benefits uh, for all the employees, to shoot up to higher benefit levels. If costs are coming down, if the returns are gonna consistently be 10, 15, 20% a year, you can afford to get better benefits. So benefit levels went up. Um, the problem is that's not sustainable because the markets aren't gonna, gonna consistently earn 12, 15%. So you need to have something, you need to have a benefit level that you can afford. What we've seen in states like California uh, with uh, the PEPR reforms in 2012, PEPR standing for Public Employee Pension Reform Act, uh, and in Arizona uh, with their tier three is for new hires after a certain level, they're putting a lower, a lower benefit level, a good benefit level that people can afford to retire with because you wanna make sure that you keep your employees throughout their career and you give them an incentive to leave when it's the right time, um, but there's a lower benefit. On top of that, uh, the second piece of sustainability is funding. How the costs are split between the agencies and the employees. Uh, in many cases, employee contribution rates get linked 
to the cost of the benefits on an ongoing basis. Uh, and, the, and the employees go back to playing a bigger part. Uh, in California, for example, when pensions were first put in place in the 1920s, 1930s, the, the costs were split 50-50 between the employees and the employers. Over time, uh, benefit improvements got added, cost of living adjustments, disability benefits, uh, you know, death benefits, uh, line of duty, uh, which were paid for just by the employer and the employer started paying a bigger portion of the whole thing. Uh, so trying to get the costs in line where the employee and the employer is sharing the costs again. Uh, the risks are still gonna be mostly on the employer, but if you try and at least design it so that on average, half the cost is paid by the employee and half by the employer, you end up with something that's more sustainable over time. Uh, so we're looking at that. And then on top of then it comes down to the, you know, the actual funding. How do you catch up for things that have happened in the past, uh, which then gets to all the areas that Dennis has been talking about with investments to try and make sure that you're investing and that you are, that your expectations for returns uh, reasonably match what you're going to get from the markets, knowing there are going to be fluctuations uh, year by year, markets do better or worse significantly. And over time periods, five years, seven years, you may have ups and downs. Uh, but to have something that you can, you know, you've got a good solid uh, match between expectations and reality. Right. Um, those are the things that help you sustain this thing over time. Right, right. Obviously, some have control over their systems and some have less so. Uh, but how do public agencies protect the solvency of their uh, retirement programs and not, you know, overly strain their, their budgets? How, how can they prepare for that? Well, part of it is, is making sure that you are consistently putting money away towards your pension plans. Um, there are... Uh, there are you know, different funding rules all across the country. Uh, in some states, there are strict uh, funding requirements where the pension plan hires the actuary, uh, sets the actuarially determined contribution, and the employer is required to pay that. The actuarially determined contribution makes sure that you pay off the unfunded liability over some fixed period of time. Uh, and that time period has been shrinking. Uh, I remember you know, a couple of decades ago, we'd regularly see 40 year amortization periods. Uh, now amortization periods are coming down to 20, 15 years, trying to make sure that you're not taking the cost for your current employees and pushing it on to future generations of taxpayers. Uh, the problem with that uh, that we saw in the last decade is that does push the cost for past generations onto the current generation of taxpayers. And that makes it tough, um, especially during times when revenues aren't strong. Uh, so in terms of funding policy, so we're gonna have a couple, couple levels of this. There's often the funding policy that's set by the retirement plan that pays the minimum amount you have to put in. And then other funding policies being made by agencies where they say, okay, at a minimum, we're gonna put in what we have to from the retirement system. But on top of that, we wanna get ahead. Sometimes they'll say, all right, we're gonna pretend that the assumptions are more conservative and give the, give the, the retirement plan more money than they asked for. In other cases, and we're seeing this right now uh, becoming more and more popular, they are taking good years in revenues where sales tax are coming in stronger or other things are happening better than expected and taking that extra money and setting it aside in a 115 trust uh, or an internal reserve so that they have money in future years when the costs go back up to still keep the, the pull on their general fund at, at something that's controllable. All right, so uh, Ira, in conclusion, um, 
as we're getting towards the end of, of this pension and OPEB Insider uh, webinar, uh, what are the tools and forecasting solutions uh, that local governments uh, can use to build upon their financial and pension resiliency, say 10, 20, 30 years from now? Right, the, the, in order to be able to, to, to set aside the right amount of money, you have to know what the right amount of money is. And that takes complicated forecasting that's done. So ha having a tool uh, like GovInvest where you can stress test, where you can take a look and see, okay, what's gonna happen, what would happen to my costs if uh, the markets returned consistently 2% less or 2% more than what we're expecting? What if, as in this example, the, the returns from tw 2000, from the dot-com bubble burst through 2020 get repeated? What is that going to do to my costs? Can I handle that? So that's one thing. That's one thing to look at. Uh, if we go to the next one, we'll see. You know, because basically we know that weak investment returns can raise contribution rates significantly, and in many cases, you don't get your actuarial valuation results uh, until six months, a year after the, the returns, and then you immediately have to put the money into the budget. The problem with that is that the higher costs come in when your revenues are lower. When the economy is weak, markets go down and revenues go down. So you cannot necessarily afford to wait until the bad news happens and then react to it. What you want to be able to do is know ahead of time what's going to be happening prepare for the bad news uh, you know, in advance and set the money aside when you have it so that you can prepare, so you can prepare for it. There are a couple questions as to how you deal with this because if you're going to have weak returns for five years and over the long term things are fine, there's a question as to whether you should lower the assumed rate of return in the plan or deal with this on a year by year basis. And I think what the next slide shows, if I remember correctly, is if you compare if that it, it, the over time, the cost of the plan are the same, whether you, uh, get, you know, take into account the actual returns or wait for them to happen. The thing is, it's a question of when you pay for it. If you lower your assumption right away and then get the lower returns, your costs are going to jump up but then come down over time. On the other hand, if you pretend you're gonna get the higher returns and keep watching the markets come in lower year after year, your costs will be moving up. And at some point, you'll end up paying more than you would have if you had taken into account. So if the markets are gonna be weak for three to five, five to seven years, maybe you keep your assumptions where they are, put extra money aside right now to get you through the tough times and, and deal with it that way. But if the markets are gonna continue doing that, staying low over time, then you wanna lower your assumptions. What this shows is adopting a lower benefit level lowers costs over time. Uh, and again, having a tool that can show you the impact of this ahead of time allows you to see the potential see the impact of changes you might be making, discuss the changes, make sure the one you pick actually works. So you have something to follow. So uh, I think this slide is about what, what is the role of the actuary in this process or, or other consultants that you might have? Right. And for, for a lot of um, a lot of agencies across the country, the, the pension plan has its own actuary and that, and the, the agency, the city, the town, the county, um, they also need somebody to advise them. So the pension plan actuary is going to do the valuation reports. They're going to give the official numbers that are going on, but you as a city or agency need to have an expert on your side 
and whether it is you know to to help you through to project the cost to understand ahead of time what those the impact of those changes to do it to do quick analysis so that you can be prepared and again make the right decision and know the impact of those decisions um and i know this is an education session but that's part of what we do at govinvest so we're there to try and help you better understand uh, what's going on and make better decisions. Um, and we're just uh, about to finish up here. I do have a question that some of our um, uh, clients audience here might be in cost sharing plans, whereby uh, that's just more common on the education side. They may be in their teachers or school employers retirement system or some sort of, uh, you know, ASRS, I think Arizona, there's a lot of examples of it. Um, and they don't really control, they don't have individual liabilities. Uh, in essence, their contribution rate is dictated to them. Um, and, but, you know, they obviously they get information from their systems is what's going to be happening. What, what would your suggestion be to those types of local governments that are in those types of, or school districts that are in those types of systems to plan for the future? Well, I, I mean, it's very important to know which things you have control over and which things you don't. Uh, and the thing is, even if you have your own pension plan, you don't control everything. You don't control the markets. You don't control the, the interest rates that are going on. You don't control whether Russia's starting World War III or China is shutting down 20% of their economy for COVID. So there are a lot of things that are outside your control that you can't stop, but you need to prepare to handle. Uh, and that's even more so when you're in a cost-sharing plan because you can't just give extra money to the retirement system. That's where some using a tool like a 115 trust is even more valuable by projecting out where you think those costs are going. And if you see the costs are potentially coming up over time, set money aside in that trust to help you handle it so that your general fund, your budget can be dealt, can work on a sustainable basis. That's how you help working through this with, with agencies all across the country. You know, find people who can help you understand the impact of all this and prepare you so you can get ahead when you have a chance, when you have some extra revenues to set aside. I think we've come to the end of this session.